Ginger, 2009. I'd already been in Uganda for coming to 10 years at this point, and a friend came to visit me from the UK. She said, Sam, I've got to show you something. Come and look at this, and led me to her room. She furtively revealed this weird object. And as she explained what it was, I confess, my eyes popped out of my head, and I couldn't quite believe my ears. The next day, I'd ordered one online, had it sent to my lovely mum in London, and a few weeks later, she brought it out to me in Uganda. I've used it nearly every month ever since. I'm going to talk about that thing that happens to almost every woman almost every month. A woman will have between 340 and 480 periods during her life, and each month, she will lose an average of 35 milliliters of blood over four to six days. 90% of women lose less than 80 milliliters of blood. Now, modern women around the world use disposable pads and tampons to conveniently manage their periods. A woman who can afford to buy as many as she wishes tends to use around 11,000 items in her lifetime. In Uganda and elsewhere, especially in rural areas, Girls and women can struggle to access these products. I've heard stories of women using tissues, cotton wool, sitting on sand, leaves, even putting mattress stuffing up there. And it's well documented that girls can struggle to access education because of challenges managing their periods. This isn't new. We've been talking about this a lot, especially in Uganda, in recent months. Now, even NGOs have been doing fantastic work. They've been providing cloth pads, uh, to girls, they've been fighting stigma with education, they've been investing in infrastructure and hand-washing facilities and advocacy with the government. These are all really, really important. But today, I want to focus on the product side of things. Each of these products we've talked about has their challenges. Disposable pads, well, they're fairly affordable, they're widely available, so they're the number one product in use. But the problem is they're not biodegradable. We find them as litter strewn over schools. If they do make their way to rubbish dumps, they stay there forever. They don't burn easily because they're wet, and if they do, they create toxic fumes. I'm an accountant, so let's do a little bit of math. Imagine just 12 pads, which isn't very many, for maybe 10 million menstruating women in Uganda. That gives us 1.8 million kilos of waste. Call it 300 elephants worth of revolting, non-biodegradable waste every single month. That's not smart, and it's not sustainable. We need something better. Apart from that, they're also full of itchy chemicals and can give you itchy lady parts. What about tampons? Well, being worn internally, they're comfortable and convenient, but they're also expensive, they're hard to find outside Kampala, and most of them are also not biodegradable, more revolting waste. How about washable pads? Well, I'm a big fan. They're environmentally friendly because they're washable and reusable, but they're also quite an ordeal to wash by hand and finding somewhere private to dry them. In today's world, full of technology, innovation, design, can't we find something better? Well, in the 1930s in America, somebody did think up something better. A product you can buy once and use for 10 years. Like a cloth pad, it's reusable. Like a tampon, it's inserted into the vagina. But unlike both of those, rather than absorb the blood, it absorbs it like a cup. It's called a menstrual cup. And you'll be glad to know that the real size is more like this. And there's an even smaller one for young girls. It's made of 100% medical-grade silicon rubber. It's soft, it's soft to the touch, and it's very flexible. But how does it work? Well, you fold it down like this, and gently wiggle it up inside. It's actually really easy after an initial learning curve. It pops open into its shape inside you. And the surprising part is when it's in properly, you actually don't feel it at all. It's completely comfortable. It has these little holes at the side, which form a sort of suction seal so that it can't leak or fall out. And it can't get lost up inside you because the entrance to the cervix is really narrow. So you can just get on with your life. 
going to school, walking, sitting, doing sports, even swimming, sleeping, even peeing. You can do everything. It stays in for four to 12 hours, depending on your flow. It actually holds more than 15 milliliters. So many girls and women can empty it just in the morning and in the evening from home. To empty it, you reach in, squeeze the base and gently wiggle it out. Empty the contents and rinse it with a little bit of water. Then pop it straight back in again. Obviously with lots of hand washing as well. At the end of the month, it needs to be disinfected, so you can boil it for five minutes, or simply pour freshly boiled water over it a few times. Then pop it in its little cotton bag and use it again and again and again. No waste, no chemicals, easy to clean, no monthly cost, comfortable, leak-free, and safe, even in Africa. It's been used by more than 2,000 girls and women in Uganda so far. And there have been very many pilot projects and research studies done in the region. I could quote a Kenyan P7 student, a primary student from Kenya, in one study who said, before, when we had the pads, we were worried that the pads or cloths could fall. But now, you can see a girl running very fast. Even when playing ball games such as netball, she jumps very high without even getting worried of other things. It's also been piloted with the Maasai in Kenya, and with the Karamajong in northern Uganda. One study last year with 38 women showed that after the pilot, the women wanted to carry on using their cups because they said it was more comfortable, more hygienic, and cheaper than other methods. When I talk about menstrual cups, I get a lot of questions. But one that comes up the most is, what about virgins? How can you use this with schoolgirls? What about the hymen? Won't it break the hymen? Here, as elsewhere, a great deal of value is placed on a girl's purity. There's a widely held belief that the best way to test if a girl is a virgin is if she has an intact hymen on her wedding night. The evidence would be blood on the bedsheets after her first intercourse as the hymen is ruptured. There's a practice where the groom presents a goat to the bride's family to thank them for keeping her pure. Just to get a sense of how embedded this custom is, in the Luganda language, the word for virginity is the same as the word for hymen, and it's the word embuzi, meaning goat. So in short, if a young virgin girl uses a menstrual cup, yes, she may need to stretch her hymen to the side a bit. The problem is that this tradition is based on a globally held misconception that the hymen is a complete barrier. In fact, it doesn't go all the way across. If it did, how would period blood get out? It's actually a stretchy ring of tissue, and it comes in very, very many different shapes or sizes. Many or most women don't bleed the first time they have intercourse. It's an entirely unreliable indicator of virginity. So yes, this young girl may stretch her hymen, but her purity, her virginity, will not be affected. I think we have a fantastic opportunity here in Uganda to do a kind of technology leapfrog, to avoid getting addicted to the disposable products and the disposable mentality of the West. Already the Ministry of Education is mainstreaming information about menstrual cups into the curriculum. Just this year, the Ministry of Finance removed VAT from menstrual cups so they can be sold for 50 to 60K, call it $15. Remember, that's for 10 years or more. The Ministry of Health is aware and supportive. To be honest, people working in this sector, government officials, NGOs, they're no longer asking the question, gee, but is this viable for Africa? They're asking, how do we scale up? The idea that I think is worth sharing it's for governments, NGOs, the private sector, pharmacies, schools, refugee camps, to make sure that this revolutionary 15 grams of silicon rubber is available to half the population of Uganda. Now, I've never been one to take myself too seriously, so uh, I'm going to sing a song. First I was afraid, I was petrified, kept thinking, how am I going to get that great big cup inside? 
Would it hurt? Would it get stuck? Would I have to see my blood? Would it cope with heavy flow? Or would I end up with a flood? Then my friends and family, they told me I could end up losing my virginity. My hymen would get ruptured, my husband give no goats, our honor would be ruined, I would have to get my code. And I said, please, let me be free to choose the option I like best for my own body. Should I just keep on blocking pits and making waste? Should we repeat the mistakes of the West? Copy paste, oh no, not I. I will survive. I know as long as I know how to manage my flow, then I can thrive. I've got all my life to live. I've got all my skills to give. I will survive. I will survive.